Now let me just begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all of our actions and carry them on by your gracious assistance so that our every prayer and work may begin from you and by you come to a successful completion. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming. And I see that there are a number of young people here today, so welcome. Are you from local or far away, or where are you from? Oh, in North Lake? St. John Vianney, North Lake. They're close by. Okay. Are you all from St. John Vianney? Oh, well, someone did a good job of getting you all here, so I'm impressed. Now, we're talking, do you know what we're talking about today? Oh, you're, okay, well, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> did you think I might do tricks or some magic tricks? Is that what you were expecting? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about a Jesuit priest by the name of Father John Harden. Have any of you ever heard of him? One. Well, I'm asking the young people here. <laughs> Anybody here hear of Father Harden? Two, three. Okay, here's a picture of him. And I'm going to explain I, in the last hour and in this how we're going to try to get this man declared a saint. Now, you should know from your religious education, what, just simply, what is a saint? Who could tell me what is a saint? I don't want, like, the sisters or priests or anybody else telling me. I want the young people. What is a saint? A saint is anybody who is where? Oh, very good. I didn't see who that was, but, right, in heaven. Is anybody, and so when do we honor everybody that's in heaven? What day of the year? Yes. Very good, All Saints Day. So on All Saints Day, we honor anybody who's in heaven. So they might be people that we knew here on earth or have been related to, maybe a mother or father or brother or sister or whatever, grandmother, grandfather. If they've died, maybe they've gone to purgatory and they're in heaven now, then they're honored on All Saints Day. But the church picks particular people to hold up for our imitation. Now, you're young, there are a lot of young people here, so we know, um, let's say, in the movie industries, I don't know who's popular, like a, for a movie star, but I'm just saying there are certain people. Or, like if you play sports, there are certain people, depending on where you're from, certain people that are very popular in sports, so you think, oh, I want to play, you know, basketball like this person, or whatever. So, you have those people that you look up to and admire. So it is in the church. We have people for different uh, things. Who could give me the name of a saint and like what they might be known for? Can anyone give me the this name of a saint? Padre Pio. Padre Pio. What was he known for? His stigmata. His stigmata. Okay. What else? Give me another saint. Anybody else? A sister? Saint Christopher, for Saint, right for travelers. Saint Christopher, another saint. C Christopher meaning Christ bearer. Anybody named Christopher here? No, it's a good name. Another saint. Like what is Saint Francis? We'll just pick him. What would he be known for? Animals, nature, work with the poor, so on. So there's a lot of saints. We just had, I see we have a little sister of the poor here, St. Jean Jugan. She worked not just with the poor, but another big segment of the population. What is the biggest segment of the population, the most growing segment of the population? Is what group of people? The older people, okay? Work with the poor, older people, okay? So, Saints rise up in the church for different reasons. So, Father Hardin died in the year 2000. Okay, so that's 10 years ago. How old were you t 10 years ago? No, how old were you 10 years ago? Five? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're showing our age here. Well, that's good. That's I wish I was five, ten years ago, but I wasn't. Okay. Well, good. So, Father Harden died on December 30th of 2000. 
all right? And while he was alive, he was many things. We could say a theologian. Do you know what a theologian is? A person who writes in what area? Theology about God, right? And he wrote about spirituality, how to live a holy life, and so on. All right? So he wrote many things. He wrote about 40, 45 books. Have anybody that's 15 or younger, have any of you read more than 40 or 45 books in your life yet? I mean, I'm not talking about your math textbook or your history textbook or something, but no, probably none of you have read 40 or 45 books, not yet. But anyway, he wrote about that, many, many articles and so on. And so he tried to help different people, priests, religious, we see sisters and brothers here, lay people, he tried to help them to understand their faith better and to live their faith better. So he worked at that. So he died in 2000. And when he died, he left to Archbishop Burke, who was at the last talk here. He left his library, which you'll see some of it on uh, the, the uh, uh, presentation. I might have to rush through to the end like I did in the last talk, but you'll see that there. Plus, he made a lot of cassettes. That was before CDs became popular. So I know if you were only five in 2000, you know we didn't always have uh, CDs or DVDs. They were cassettes. And before that, there was nothing, just <laughs> old phonographs. But they couldn't record things, I mean, like talks and so on. So Father Hardin left many th uh, uh, cassette tapes and so on to help people live a good Catholic life. So he, when he died, he left his library and his works to Archbishop Burke, who had been the Archbishop of St. Louis and has since been moved to Rome. So it is my job to try to get put this man's life together here and then present it to Rome. So that's what we're going to give a talk about. Extended summary of procedure. So diocesan phase. So in the diocese, usually a cause starts in the diocese where a person died. So uh, Archbishop, or uh, rather Father Hardin, died in Detroit, in the Detroit Archdiocese. He was a Jesuit priest and died in December, on December 30th of 2000. So for many reasons, which we're not going to digress to this afternoon, the cause, though, operates out of St. Louis, because Archbishop Burke was the archbishop there. So the petitioner of the cause, that if someone wants to move the cause forward, they say, well, let's see, what is your name? Nicole. Nicole. Well, we'll go ahead about 80 years. That'll make you, how old are you now? 13. Okay, so that'll make you 93. So that's a good age. Maybe at that age you die and go to God to be judge and so on. So in the aftermath of your life, Nicole, and the legacy that you've left on this earth, people say, well, we would like to make Nicole have her declared a saint. So someone has to be appointed the postulator. You know, it won't be me then, because <laughs> if you'll be 93, I'll be long gone too. So someone petitions... Uh, to have a priest appointed um, uh, with the consent of the bishop. So uh, in St. Louis, the bishop now is an Archbishop Robert Carlson. The petitioner is one of the organizations that Father Hardin founded, Eternal Life, which is based out of Bardstown, Kentucky. And they have uh, a table, I think, in the room uh, on, beyond the break here. And they sell some of Father Hardin's writings and things like that. So they are the petitioner, uh, and I am what's called a postulator. You see that word there? What is it to postulate something? Do you know what it is to postulate something? Oh, do I have to answer all the questions? I am just asking the young people. So the anybody above a certain age, I don't know what age it is, but they're home free. But I'm asking the young people, trying to get them, what would it mean to postulate something? <coughs> Anybody here know what it means to postulate? No, don't worry, it's nothing bad. It's all good. 
Well, all right. To question, to propose, to move forward. Okay. This cause of Father Harden. So the postulator presents a biography, a list of published writings and witnesses. So um, if you go to the website, and before it, anyone gets out of this room, especially the young people, I'll see that you get a prayer card with uh, Father Harden's uh, um, picture and the website. I know all of you like to be on the computer. Am I right? I know I'm right. <laughs> and uh, so you can go to hardensj.org. You can find a little biography of Father's life. Actually, we have that on the table there, too as well as a list of his writings that's in the biography and so on. So I'll see that you get that before you get out of this room. I'll, if I have to, I'll go lock the door, run down there and get it and be back. But anyway, we want to just kind of move things along here. Okay, so the bishop decides to investigate and instruct the cause. So some of these things were a little out of order because when Archbishop Burke was the archbishop there, there were people who knew... Father Hardin, who were elderly, or if they weren't elderly, some of them were sick, very sick and close to death. So he wanted to get them interviewed uh, in their relationship with Father Hardin. Uh, among them was Sister Priscilla, who helped uh, now Blessed Teresa of Calcutta. Do you know Mother Teresa? Okay, you should know her name. So Sister Priscilla was like her first assistant, and she's got Parkinson's disease. She's not well, so we had to get her her uh, testimony and so on. So some of these things have been done out of order. The bishop consults the local bishops concerning appropriateness of the cause. Bishop calls on the faithful to make submissions on the cause. Published writings of the servant of God are examined by theologians. So why do you think they're going to look at someone's writings? What do you think like Nicole, jumping ahead 80 years here, you've died and gone to God. 80, 93 is a good age. I mean, we can't, you know, we can't knock it, right, if you live to be 93. But what are they going to look at your writings for, do you think? You know, what you said about God, or if you said something that would be what? Spiritual, or maybe something that wasn't right. You know, not everybody that writes is correct, right? I could teach you that two and two are five, but am I correct? No, you're right. Okay. So I would be wrong, but I'm not teaching you that. I'm just using that as an example. So I don't want you to go home and say that priest, he thought two and two were five because it's three, right? So, okay. So anyway, want to look at, at a person's writings to see what, right, what they said about God and people's relationship with God and so on, that, that there are not ideas that are contrary to the faith. What does it mean to be contrary to the faith? What it, does it mean to be contrary? Okay, I'm going to get an answer out of this table, and then I'm going to go over there. What does it mean to be contrary? Do you know what it means to be contrary? To be against, all right? So if I say yes, and you're contrary, you're going to say no, right. If I say right, and you're going to be contrary, you're going to say wrong. wrong. If I'm going to say it's a nice day out, you're going to say it's huh? bad, right, not nice, whatever. Okay, so to be contrary. So we want to see if there are any things contrary to the faith, okay, people saying things contrary to the faith. Okay, then the formal inquiry on virtues or martyrdom. Now, Father Hardin was not a martyr. What is a martyr in the church? Anybody know what a martyr is? Let's get someone over here. We haven't heard from this corner yet. What would a martyr be? We even use that expression, right? Doesn't someone say, oh, you're making yourself out to be a martyr? Did you ever hear it used that way? What does a martyr mean? Take a guess. You could only be wrong. <laughs> even even I've been wrong in life. Yes. Uh, someone who like dies for like, the church. Right for Christ. Okay. They want to give witness to be a martyr. They shed their blood. Over. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad it resonated with someone else. But okay. But Father was not a martyr in the strict sense. 
but we want to look at virtues. What are virtues? In this corner, I haven't heard from this corner. What are virtues? Has anybody told you to live a virtuous life? I'm sure they have. Anybody tell you to... Do you know what virtues are? Right thoughts, correct. So virtues are good habits, right? So you have to have the thought to act. If I, if let's say you gave me a birthday gift or something, and I had the thought to send you a thank you note, is that sufficient? No, I have to act on that. So I have to sit down and write you a thank you note for the birthday gift. So, so virtues are good habits. I'm sure your parents want you to be virtuous, right? I am sure that uh, your teachers want you to be virtuous, right? That you have good habits. As an aside, what is the opposite of a virtue, do you know? Well, in the interest of time, oh yes? Vice, right. You know how on they have vice squads in the police department? So they're checking out people with bad habits, you know, that do bad things repeatedly. So, okay. So, Father Harden, we want to look at the virtues in his life. So someone that lives close to God, what would be some of the virtues? What would be some of the good habits in their life we would be looking for? Well, right, that a person is humble. And Hart, Father Hardin, if you knew him, he was very humble. He knew that his great mind came from God. Very good. He, that it came from God, his ability to write and to synthesize things. What else besides humility would be another virtue? Yes? Faith. faith, exactly. He had a very strong faith. And he wrote about different aspects of faith. Okay, what else would be a virtue? Faith, humility, yes? Oh, very loyal to God. He was very loyal to God. And he would not be cowed by what other people thought and so on with regards to God. Okay? So, in this uh, third step, we're going to look at the virtues of his life, okay, and get witnesses from other dioceses because Father worked all over the country to attest to this. And so uh, he's already been given the title of servant of God, which is the first step. So, um, and as I say, some of the things in Father's life are out of order uh, because, um, you know, there were people that had to be interviewed and so on. Okay, the diocesan inquiry on miracle. Now, as I said in the last group, you know, in order to get someone declared a saint, you have to have miracles. And people get confused sometimes, you know. It's not like a good luck charm. You know, I've got this bad news. Let's say maybe I've, the doctor told me I have cancer or something, and so uh, I need some just good luck. But in order for a miracle to take place, a person has to be open or disposed to God. And so I gave a uh, ex- couple of examples. Like when you pray for a miracle, you have to be praying just to, to, to one person. In this case, you have to be praying to Father Harden. You can't like be praying to Father Harden, uh, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, you know, three or four other people up for canonization. Sometimes people do that, and I suppose... Let's say if you or maybe if you're married, your husband or wife or your child, your children, you know, someone gets a diagnosis of, of having cancer, you're obviously very desperate and want to pray because you don't want that person to become sicker or eventually to die. And so you want to pray and your mind, mind might go in many different ways. Uh, but as I say, it is important that whatever you're praying for, that you pray to one particular person for a particular matter. Also, and, you know, I, I, I'll give an example. Last uh, um, summer, I was up here, and I was staying at the retreat house on the grounds here, the Cardinal Stritch Retreat House. So I was there, and there were some priests from St. John Cantius in Chicago, and uh, they were running a workshop, so I gave them some prayer cards to put in the back of church. So I'm not back in St. Louis a few days, and a woman calls, and she said, Oh, Father, I just picked up a prayer card on Father Harden in the back of church at St. John Cantius. I said, You're kidding. I just gave them 
to those priests, I think on Thursday, this is like Monday, see how cyclical things are. So she starts telling me how she and her husband were bringing their son up to O'Hare Airport. He's in the military somewhere and had to go back. And it was a Sunday morning, and they didn't want to go to Mass. You know, they have Mass at O'Hare, I don't know how many times. And, you know, it's hard to park and go in there. So they said, we stopped at St. John Kent, just picked up this prayer card. So I said, oh, well, that's wonderful. But she said, my brother's grandson, who was an infant about three weeks old, uh, became very ill and was airlifted from Springfield, Illinois, to the Children's Hospital in St. Louis. She said, could you bring a relic of Father Harden? I said, I will do that. So I went that night, like about 10 o'clock. She said, I will warn you, his wife uh, is not Catholic and very hostile. And she was <laughs> to Catholics and her mother, who was there too. But that's okay. So anyway, I went there late at night said some prayers, left the relic, left them some prayer cards of Father Harden. Well, as time went on, you know, the child was in and out of the hospital. He had to have a, a liver replaced, and they could not find a liver of an infant, so they had to give him an adult liver, you know, and he was only like three weeks old, and got very complicated, and so on. And um, But as this woman would call about every month or so, every three weeks, and then I would check online on the computer, on the internet, there's a place called Caring Bridge, and then you have to put the name of the person in, of like people who are terminally or grievously ill, so you can kind of keep up without having to always ask people. So I would check there, and I still do. The infant is still alive, although he's had a lot of problems. But as she was starting to tell me about her nephew, you know, there were just a lot of other obstacles. For example, he and his wife were not married in the Catholic Church, so that is one obstacle. Plus, I kind of suspected as I went there a few times after, you know, like they were not saying the prayer to Father Harden. So, I mean, I can say the prayer, but it's obviously not my son. I mean, you know, and I would l want the child to be well or to find a, they were looking for another liver because that one liver was just too big and not taking to the infant's body and so on. But the thing is, you know, all these things are to lead him and his wife to faith and for, let's say, the miraculous cure of this infant. through, But, you know, so many things were not right here. And uh, so anyway, um, I, you know, trying to deal with the, the marriage situation is just another matter. I mean, he doesn't live in St. Louis. And so there are just a lot of complications. So people have to be disposed to faith. You know, as I say, when it's not just a lucky charm because someone's gotten ill, but, you know, there have to be, as I say, uh, authentic miracles for them to take place. There have People have to be open to God's grace and working in their life. So we need miracles to prove that this person eventually is in heaven. And so at this point, we don't need the miracles, although they could happen and would have to be documented. Then, if once everything is completed here, it is sent to Rome or what is called the Roman phase, where they look at all this information. Now, when people ask me, I say this more for the benefit of the adults here, how long does this process take? I do not know. I do know my co-worker, who is now at another talk, James Molinato, upstairs. But we, about two years ago, we, we had a meeting with Bishop P Joseph Perry, an auxiliary here in Chicago, who is a priest of Milwaukee. And uh, he was an advisor on the cause of Archbishop Fulton Sheen out of Peoria, Illinois. And he just said to us that it was eight years from start to finish uh, on the Fulton Sheen cause before it all went to Rome. So I tell people, well, it could be eight years. It could be a little less. It could be a little more. And the adults will know that there are certain comparisons in the sense that both Archbishop Sheen and Father Hardin wrote an awful lot. And whereas Archbishop Sheen had a, a television series which Father Hardin didn't have, but Father Hardin had, you know, a many, many cassettes of on many topics of faith, the creed, the sacraments, to different religious communities that basically all be the same in general, but not in particular, you know, giving uh, formation to religious communities and so on, how to live the vows and the like. So uh, all of that has to be uh, coordinated before it is sent to Rome. And so in Rome, they will receive all that sometime. It probably will be, I don't want to say, uh, I hope it's in my life at least it gets over there, but one never knows. It's all in the providence of God. 
and over there, then, a postulator is approved by the congregation of saints. And then they look at the life of a person to see, again, what has been presented as proof or evidence of the holiness and the integrity of this person's life. Do you know what I mean by integrity of a person's life? What does it mean to have integrity? Take a guess. Have you ever heard that word, integrity? What does it mean to have integrity? Do I have to answer? Or do I have to call on an adult? <laughs> That's what they're hoping. They call on an adult. Well, to have an integrity. Like, do your teachers tell you to have integrity? A what? Well, positive attitude, right. But in, to have integrity, yes. Very good, togetherness. To have like an integrated life. Like what are the different parts of your life? Like what do you do from Monday to Friday, from 9 to 3? You go where? And what what are you trying to develop when you go to school? Knowledge, Knowledge your mind. Okay, so you have a mind. Everybody here have a mind? Yeah. Very good. What else do you have? Well, you have a heart, right? So you want to develop it. How do you develop, let's say, your heart, the affective side of you? How do you develop that? Love. You have to give love. You have to receive love. You have to be considerate, so on. So you want to develop, let's say, the heart. What else? Well, your brain, okay. That ties in. I mean, there are distinctions with your, your intellect, but okay. What else? We all have. You're looking at. Well, muscles are part of your body, right. Do you have to develop your body? Get exercise? What does your mother and father tell you you have to do? What kind of food do you have to eat? Chips for breakfast? <laughs> Soda for lunch? <laughs> what would be good for dinner? Um, cake. Is that a good diet? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's is the proper answer, right? That is, is not a good diet. I'm just being facetious. So you want to develop your body, your mind, and what else do you have to develop? Your body and your soul, right. How do you develop your soul? How do you exercise that? Well, going to church, going to Mass is one way. How else? Spiritual reading. How else? What else develops your soul? What gives your soul muscles? Praying. Praying. All of these things. You have to do that to develop your soul. You want to develop your soul? Both of you. Do you? Okay, just checking. All right. So, the evidence of the virtues. Okay. Uh, okay. This is when it gets to Rome. Carlson's and Bishop study the documentation and the report of theologians and so on. Okay, approval of miracles. Like I say, we're at, at the point, uh, we don't need them right now, although if they came, certainly they'd be useful. They can come at any time because God works always in his own time with regards to miracles. Then eventually, once in Rome, they accept a cause and a person is declared venerable. And then once you have... Miracles, they're declared uh, beatification, they're beatified, they use the word blessed, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta is at the second level, she's blessed, and if they get another miracle, she'll be canonized, declared a saint. And, uh, right, sisters here, Saint, her foundress, of the Little Sisters of the Poor, was canonized last October, Jean Jugan, so before that she was blessed Jean Jugan, now she is Saint Jean Jugan. So that, and then that means that she is worthy of being imitated uh, and looked up to, prayed to by the Catholic faithful. So we don't need just rock stars and, and uh, movie stars. We need saints as well. Now, in St. Louis, we operate out of the convent, the former convent of the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. Have any of you been to St. Louis? I don't mean the adults. Any of the kids been to St. Louis? Uh, we need a field trip. <laughs> right when school gets out. we got to get those buses lined up. Anyway, this is what's called the Father Harden Room. You can see some of the books he wrote. Catholic Lifetime Reading Plan. Uh, Theology of Grace. 
cassettes, all of these things, pictures from Father Hardin's life. Here is Father Hardin's cassock. Here is the Catholic Catechism he wrote. Here's a picture of Archbishop Burke and Father Hardin. This is his doctoral dissertation. You know when you get a doctoral degree? Not for a medical doctor, but in a, a uh, area of, of study. So that's his doctoral dissertation. You cannot see it, but lying down there, if Father becomes declared a saint, is his American Express card. <laughs> because, you know, American Express says, don't leave home without it. So... Every, every, even the saints need a credit card because, and probably if he lived long enough, he would have had a cell phone or BlackBerry. I don't even know how to use a BlackBerry, but Father would have had to learn. So, all those gadgets. This is more of Father's, uh, 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 the Father Harden room. There are some pictures which will be shown tonight at dinner, and they're on our, you know, there's Father as a young boy in about eighth grade when he was younger, his ordination pictures and so on. Uh, those are some more of his books on display. Now, here's Father's correspondence. This is just two walls. It's contained in about 18 filing cabinets and probably about two, between 200 and 250 filing boxes of correspondence. Have any of you in school written that much? Anybody? No, I didn't think so. So myself and my coworker have to go through all this and try to put it in some kind of order. So that's how we occupy our time. Here's some more boxes and some more boxes on other walls. Then Father had cassette tapes and of course Unlike Archbishop Sheen, he was not a very powerful voice. He was very soft-spoken <laughs> and very gentle. So being able to uh, coordinate all those will be a, a project. This is some of Father Hardin's library. There are, there are over 3,000 volumes. Okay. Anybody in school here have 3,000 volumes at home? Do you in your room? have 3,000 books? No? I didn't think so. So, okay. So this is an example of Father's library. So, and that brings us to the end of the Servant of God, Father John Anthony Hard. Now, are there any questions, some remarks I'll make in a few moments. Any questions that people want to ask me? I'm sure this is open to the adults because they would have more questions. But if the young people have questions, you can ask me too. I'm Father Harden, I mean... <laughs> yes, sister. Oh no, uh, no. We're just trying to sort all this out. We're still trying to get through those boxes to extract, like what is not essential to the cause. You know, as we go through that, like a lot of people, again, it gives a context in which Father worked and operated. But like, there'll be a catechism that their son or daughter was using in high school. You know, everything circled, or you know, mm -hmm. some kind of usually theological defect. But, you know, so, like, we're still extracting through those boxes. Uh, we had a meeting last week with a man to uh, uh, try to begin taking those boxes and putting them, uh, you know, on disks and then having them stored. I don't even understand all this in cyberspace. I didn't want to use this number at the last talk, but it's like at 48 cents a page. I mean, all this, this is high tech. You know, it's not like taking a 10-page term paper and running it off down at the Xerox machine. I mean, this is high-tech kind of stuff. So our meeting with Archbishop Burke tomorrow, I didn't want to send him into cardiac arrest <laughs> at the first talk since uh, he's the honoree tonight. That wouldn't, wouldn't be a good idea. But anyway, we have to, you know, uh, get funding for that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's where we're at, you know, with this. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I know a lot of times when um, you're becoming a saint, they mm -hmm. do the body. Oh, right, correct. Well, uh, when do they do that? Well, they don't always do that, but uh, usually they d have to do it at some point in the course. And with the case of Father Hardin, after Father Hardin had died, Archbishop Burke 
had requested from the provincial to have Father Hardin's body moved from Clarkston in Michigan to the shrine in La Crosse. There is a crypt there for Father Hardin. And the provincial at the time, who is different from the provincial now, felt that a, a number of the older Jesuits went out to Father's grave to pray, as well as many people who knew Father in the Detroit area would go out. Clarkson is what, about like an hour outside of Detroit, you know. And so he did not want the body moved. At some point, I know Archbishop Burke has the intention of asking again, I don't know when, uh, the provincial, you know, to move the body. So at that point, it would probably be opened and to see whether his body is incorrupt. Do you know what that means, that the body is incorrupt? What, yes? Decayed or not, right, because remember on Ash Wednesday, the priest puts ash, he says, remember man that you are dust and unto dust you shall return. So most of us when we die, we're put in the ground, we go back, right, our body decays, right? That happens. So, but sometimes with the saint, the body is incorrupt. So whether that will be the case, you know, we'll know then. So there'll be a time, as I say, when Father, but it's just as, is not opportune at this point. Will it have to be done before he's canonized? Uh, yeah, it probably will be done before, you know, right. Huh? But as I say, we have plenty of work cut out for us here. We did also, I mean, we, we it, in promoting Father's cause, you know, we lost a year after Archbishop Burke went to uh, Rome. And then Archbishop Carlson came in June of last year and accepted the cause in August. So, like, we lost about a year, you know, as far. That's why this is only in the, since September have we been really public about Father Hardin's cause. So we're just getting off the ground. So thank you. Now, just a few closing remarks, if you don't. Uh, okay. I see the work of the Archive and Guild as first the preparation, as I outlined, of the diocesan phase of the cause to go to Rome. And as I say, whether this takes six or seven or eight years or nine years, I don't know. But secondly, is to pr promote the spirituality and apostolic legacy of the servant of God, of Father John Anthony Hardin. And so to make people aware of Father Hardin and of his life. And um, maybe could I, does anyone know where our table is down there and to the right? Uh, the uh, Father Hardin Archive and Guild. <laughs> Do you, sister, do you know? Yeah. yeah. Could you go get me for the young people here the prayer, some prayer cards, and then there are those brochures, you know, with Father's picture. You'll see them on the table there. Thank you. Okay. And um, so to make people aware of Father Hardin and his legacy to the church, and again, the adults, the religious, will know uh, the Institute on Religious Life is one of his legacies. But you know, he fought against many things in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even things that are still present. But it is much easier as a religious, as a priest, you know, today than it was thir easier, I mean, relatively speaking. And there are difficulties every day. But they will understand what I mean in living religious life, authentic religious life. It's a whole different environment today. But that we're able to do that. I you know, attribute to Father Hardin and others that assisted him and people who've known the Institute for years know many of the lay people and other priests, Father Downey, Father Day, Bill Fairman, um, Bill uh, Isaacson, and others, you know, who helped Father Hardin in the early days. And then finally, uh, as in any enterprise, um, there is always uh, on the uh, financial needs to be met as well. And uh, so periodically we send out letters and so on for financial help. Uh, you can, you know, contribute online as well. Uh, we are primarily funded by the Eternal Life, which is another organization Father Hardin founded in Bardstown, Kentucky. They're the principal ones to undertake this cause. But certainly, as they say, you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. So it is important that other people uh, be of assistance as well. So I just, as I say, make this, make you aware of the process that we are engaged in. And I certainly ask for your support and your prayers in the work that goes before us. Now, any other questions on things? Yes, John.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you brought that up, I and mean, I haven't forgotten that. You know, it'd be nice. There are a couple of different ways to approach that, yeah. and I've even spoken to Barbara Middleton about that. You know, she what? Yeah, stuff. I'm sure she does. Yeah, you know. So, I mean, that's out there to do to again, at least visually, make people because we are in such an audiovisual a age. And Father Harden was a great promoter. You know, someone brought up to me how he would give blessings over the phone. You know, at the end, of, and I, I do remember him doing that <laughs> with people. And so, I mean, that nowadays, you know, you have like Skype and so on. You could talk to someone in the Antarctic <laughs> and give a blessing. Oh, okay. Are there, are there some underneath? And everybody's the, getting one of those on their plate at the banquet. Oh, right? okay. Well, I'll give these out. To the, I don't, are you coming to the banquet? I don't know. I'll give those. Why don't here? You can give those out here. Why don't you give those out on this side here? And then I'll give these over here. Yes? For the students here, how, how does the church define a, a miracle? And how, um, how do they, uh, obviously they link it to the saint through prayer, but um, to explain to the kids, um, what does that saint do? Why do we say that, that the, the miracle is necessary? Well, the miracle is necessary because then it proves that the person has intercession in heaven, you know, before the throne of God. The miracle has to be something documented that is contrary to nature. So let's say you had received a diagnosis of, let's say, terminal cancer, you know, of some kind, you know, and then um, through prayer and, you know, uh, intercession with Father Harden, the doctor says, you know, I don't know, you know, three months ago you were here, here are your x-rays, you know what I mean? It was in your bone, it was in your liver, it was in, you know, and you're cured. I mean, that would be something contrary to nature, against nature, and it would be documented evidence. You know, not just that, oh, I had this, you know, pain in my back when I walked, like sciatic or something, and now I don't have it anymore. But, you know, it have to, would have to be something. So that would be... Any other questions? I'd ask you to stand. I'll give a blessing and we'll see you in church. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Well, thank you for your attention and your time. God bless you.